Chapter 7 of Daniel. Daniel chapter 7 begins the prophetic portion of this book. So the first six chapters were more historical, and now we're going into the prophetic portion of the book. Not that there wasn't prophecy previously, but it was more focused on the historic events that took place, and now it's going to be talking about prophetic events that take place in the future from Daniel. So Daniel's writing these down. These are things that are going to take place in the future. The funny thing is they didn't think that Daniel actually lived in the time that he lived because his prophecies were too accurate. Because he gave too much detail and accuracy in what he was saying. And so they said, there's no way he could have known this. Uh, well, yeah, I guess you don't believe God knows the future because God knows the future and he shared it with Daniel. So what's the purpose of biblical prophecy anyway? Bible prophecy is one quarter of the Bible, of all scripture, more than one quarter. Well, we know that it comforts us. When we read... Uh, Daniel was going to be discomforted by what he sees today in this vision that he has. It's going to cause him to be a little um, confused, a little um, disconcerted. But it reminds us that God has a plan. And we hear the good, the bad, and the ugly in the whole plan. It's told to us from the beginning to the end. It reminds us about the truth of God's sovereignty. Because we have it all right here before us. It proves that the Bible is true. Authenticating the Bible as the word of God. If I told you that today you were going to win the lottery and you went and bought a lottery ticket and you didn't win the lottery, you probably wouldn't trust me after that. And if I told you that you were going to win the lottery, I, I would just tell you that hoping that you would share it with me um, if, you, if you won. But it's also a warning to the nations. Bible prophecy warns the nations, telling them of the first and second coming of the Messiah. That's all in Bible prophecy. Just uh, in Daniel's books, he tells us all of these things. But throughout all of the scriptures, we hear of the coming of the Messiah and his return when he comes again. Today's message is titled, Daniel's Dreams and Visions. We continue our study through the book of Daniel with chapter 7 in verse 1. And we read, In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream, telling the main facts. Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea, and four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. The first was like a lion, and had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man. And a man's heart was given to it. So we start with this great sea being stirred up. Uh, many commentators believe the great sea is the great sea of humanity. Some say it's the great sea, the Mediterranean Sea. Um, so I don't know. It doesn't really matter what the sea is. These beasts rise up out of the sea. And whether it's the Mediterranean or the great sea of humanity, uh, they rise up. There are four empires that are going to be on the earth. And Nebuchadnezzar was the first one. Remember his dream where he saw the vision of the statue in his dream. 
and it had four different types of metals, and then we understood what those what that vision meant. He was the top part, the head, and then the chest was the Medes and the Persians, and then after that the Greeks, and then after that the Romans. And so Daniel is having another vision similar to that, and the first kingdom was like a lion, and the Babylonian Empire was led by Nebuchadnezzar. And he exalted himself uh, above everything, everyone, every god. He exalted himself. And that's why he had to be put down for a while. He had to crawl around for seven years and be humbled out there in the wilderness. And that's like having his wings plucked off of him and now he's crawling around. But then he was raised back up again. And he was put back into his kingdom. He had a heart of a man. So he had a heart of a beast at first. But then he was given the heart of a man. And he was restored to his kingdom. And he was humbled in the experience as uh, that went on. So Daniel's vision is very close to what we're going to see here. The the interesting thing is, when Nebuchadnezzar had his vision, it was about empires. It was about kingdoms. It was about men. And it it spoke of men that were in leading the kingdoms. This is a different vision in that it's a vision from God's perspective. It's all about beasts these different beasts that were being raised up. Because in God's eyes, we're all beasts. Now, I I don't want to offend anyone, you know. Oh, I'm not a beast, you know. Just thinking that makes you a beast. Um, It's the fact that we are not at God's level. You know, we're, we're humans. And God sees all humanity as needing to be saved, needing to uh, be lifted up and um, needing to be strengthened because we can't do anything on our own. That's how come we know that we can do all things in Christ, but we can't do it on our own. We try. I don't know how many times I've tried to do things on my own and found out I just wasn't able to do it. I needed God's help, or I needed someone else's help who knows God. Okay, you, you know God, come on over and help me, because we, together we can do this. And that's why, we, that's why we have church, so that we can join together, encourage each other, pray for one another, and help each other through good times, through bad times, through struggles. Uh, we can... Um, pray for each other and exhort each other with the wisdom that God gives us through the word of God. And so that's why we do church together. It's not just a social club. Oh, I think there is a part of being in church that is social, that we do have fellowship and we can have folks that are coming through that are going to different places and they stop in for a Sunday they're brothers and sisters in Christ. Isn't that cool? And we get to meet them and we get the fellowship with them and we're going to see them in heaven again. And, uh, you know, we're going to be able to, hey, do you remember when you were in town in Fountain Hills? <laughs> Verse five. And suddenly another beast, a second, like a bear, it was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. And so the second beast is a bear. The bear represents the Persians and the Medes. It was raised up on one side because one nation was stronger than the other. The Persian nation was the strong nation and uh, the Medes was the smaller nation. But together... Um, They were uh, very, very powerful. They had three ribs in the mouth. That's three nations that were conquered 
by the Persians, actually. It was the Persians, they conquered the Medes. And so they absorbed, but at the same time, the Medes had conquered the Assyrians. And so now you have the Persians and Medes, and the Assyrians are just part of that. But most of the Assyrians were wiped out before then. And the other two nations were Lydia, which was a, an Asia Minor nation that was very strong at their time, but they were conquered by the Persians. And also now Babylon that was conquered by the Medes and the Persians. And Cyrus, uh, the Persian, was the one that led this uh, big army and continued to take on. And so they believe, uh, I, I don't know that they actually had a census of how large this group was, but um, the, it covered Egypt and Ethiopia and all of the Middle East countries there, all the way up into Turkey and um, Lebanon and all of that area was all part of the Medes and Persians, Iran and Saudi Arabia. That was all part of one big country, nation, uh, that they were in charge of that Cyrus was over. And then in verse 6, we read, After this I looked, and there was another, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird, and the beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. So the leopard is very fast, very powerful animal, and it had four wings which means that it was very fast. It was a fast-moving animal. Well, that represents Alexander the Great. In four years, he conquered the world with his armies. And it was just an amazing feat. He swept in, conquered the whole world, and then he was like, well, nothing else to do. You know, I, I did it all. I've conquered the world. Um, and so he died. Uh, and in dying, he gave the, well, the, the generals that were the leaders, the four generals that led his armies, they took over. And each of them had different areas that uh, they took over. That was the four heads that the dominion was given to those uh, generals. And so, uh, you know, it, it kind of makes me think, sometimes we have a goal. Alexander the Great had a goal, and he accomplished his goal, and he was kind of like Solomon, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. You know, when he accomplished what he set out to do, it was like, I, I, this isn't what I expected. It's kind of like when you buy a new car. It's really nice until you get the first payment. And, and oh, what, insurance is that much? That's crazy. And you think that things are going to be different than what they actually turn out to be. So Alexander um, conquered the world, but he gave that up to his generals when he died. Verse 7, after this I saw the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking into pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. So the fourth beast is similar to the statue that Nebuchadnezzar uh, dreamed about. It was the Roman Empire, which never actually was conquered, uh, but it just kind of faded away because it didn't maintain the, the power that it had. So it declined as an empire, but it, it's still, Italy is still there. The Rome, Rome is still there. Uh, but in the future, there will be a revived Roman Empire. We don't know what that's going to look like. The Bible tells us all about it uh, in that it's going to be there, but not that we know the details. 
Sometimes we get caught up with things like that. I want details. I love details. You know what I mean? I want to hear exactly what's going to happen and when it's going to happen. Both Cheryl and I, as we were raising the kids, uh, you know, we wanted details from them about where they were going, what they were doing, you know, so on and so forth. And it was always, well, I'm just going to hang out. Hang out. Where? On the freeway? Where? I, I want more details so that we can be sure you're safe. I was the one hanging out on the freeway when I was a kid. And so, um, you know, my parents were always wanting more details about what I was going to do. I, I made stuff up. So, um, but I'm, I'm here today. So, uh, obviously, I was okay with that. Notice the ten horns are similar to the ten toes that were in Nebuchadnezzar's vision. So, we get more details in verse 8. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there, in this horn, were eyes like eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words. The little horn is the Antichrist, who will rise, and he will dethrone three of the other horns, um, that have raised up people over the years. Now, I've been studying prophecy for 30 years. And as I study prophecy, I realize that most people get it wrong. Even me. Because you look at events taking place in the world today. Oh, this means this and this means that. And so everyone wants to try to put a meaning on something going on. You know, the Ukraine war, oh, that means this and that. No, it just means that there's a war. In Matthew 24, there are going to be wars and rumors of wars. And that's what we're seeing in Ukraine. It's a war. There are wars going on all over the world. The only key to everything that's going to happen in prophecy is Israel. Israel is the key. And so when we know what's going on with Israel, when we see the things happening in Israel, we can look and say, oh, we're getting close. Look at what's going on here in Israel. And so we see Israel is surrounded on every side. They have all their enemies trying to attack them right now. And for some reason, they just aren't successful. Because Israel has the largest army in the Middle East. They're just a puny little country. And they are fighting battles on every side. How are they successful? God. That's the only answer. It, because there is no other explanation for how they can be so successful. I can say the same thing about my own life. How did I get here today? Well, obviously this isn't a TED talk. So you didn't come here to be encouraged by my vast knowledge of things. Um, you know, it's about scripture. It's about what God wants to teach not only you, but me. And he's teaching us through his word. And so I got here today by studying the Word of God, by believing the Word of God, by saying, you know what, I just want to make that part of my life, teaching the Word of God and sharing the truth. It's, it's hard sometimes because people come in here maybe that are not saved, that don't have a relationship with Jesus. And I'm talking about meat. You know, I'm bringing the word of God and I bring the meat of the word of God. And so they're like, oh my goodness, I, I only have gums, you know, I'm, where's the milk, you know? And so sometimes that's how it is, you know, but I pretty much know, now some of you are visiting, but I pretty much know everyone in here and I know what your walk is like with Christ. And so I know that 
we need to be eating meat, especially in the day and age that we're living in right now. We need to be fully um, in the word and sure of what the word teaches us. We need to be sure that we're prepared for whatever is coming next. The world is doing all kinds of crazy things. And I don't know what to... Did, has any of you had a prophecy that the world was going to be like this today? You know, well, we did. We had the Bible, but we don't have the details about how we were going to get to the end. You know, we, we read Revelation when we went through that study before Daniel. And as we went through Revelation, we saw what was going to happen in the future. It's not going to happen to us. We're out of here. Then that will happen, right? And, and so we saw what is going to happen. But right now we're living in the time in between Jesus rising from the dead and the church being taken and leaving this earth. And so that's called the church age. That's the age that we're living in right now. It's kind of cool to be part of the church age. And so when people come in here and they're, they don't have a lot of knowledge about what the Bible says and, and what we teach in the Bible, they kind of get choked up um, on the meat. But I'm not going to stop teaching meat because we all need it in the days that we're living in. And so if you are afraid to bring your unsaved neighbors to um, church, if you bring an unsaved neighbor in and say, oh, by the way, this is an unsaved, let me know because I will throw a salvation message in to the message because I want everyone to be saved. You know, so I'm going to include that salvation message in there. So don't be afraid uh, to invite your unsaved neighbor into church because we're talking about all, all of the meat and all of the tough topics because they can get saved, and they can get saved even here in the tough topics. They may be going, oh, I never heard this before, you know, and they may be a little freaked out by it, but you know, that's part of coming into a relationship with Jesus. Remember, no one comes to God except the Holy Spirit draws them in. So if an unsaved person comes in here, the Holy Spirit drew them in here, and the message will fester in their heart. Oh, they may not get saved that day that they come in here, but the Word of God will eventually find its way uh, into their lives. So we uh, read about the horns and the ten horns. We're not sure who this organization is. People always try to say, oh, that's this organization. Oh, that's th this group of ten. That that's the European Union. And I've heard all kinds of stories over the years. And they mostly have been proven wrong. Uh, so it, it's not that we're going to figure that out. Uh, when that time comes. As a matter of fact, we're not going to be here when that time comes. And so uh, I'm not concerned about who this organization is, who the Antichrist is. I I'm not concerned. People are always looking for the Antichrist. I'm not looking for the Antichrist. I'm looking for Jesus Christ. Amen. And uh, the Antichrist is going to come, but if I told you, oh, that's the Antichrist, and it actually is, if I was right about that, and it, it is, what good is that? What, how does that help us at all? It, it's really who Jesus is and what our relationship is like with him. So there's an interesting parallel in the scripture with Revelation chapter 17 and verse 12, where we read, the ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have received no kingdom as of yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. They are of one mind, and they will give their power and authority to the beast. 
so there's John talking about the ten horns. And these are ten kings. And they give their power to the beast. That is something that we see in our world today. One man rises up and everyone gives their power to him. And oh, we're, you know, this is the guy, this is our man. And we're going to give our authority, give our power to that person. And we see it all over the world in different kind of organizations and, and uh, different governments. And uh, generally it doesn't work out real well. Not even for the United States. It seems like we have given up power to our government, thinking that the government is going to be the ones to help us. And uh, it, it seems like we're, that's not working. You know, I, I didn't expect it to work, but because everyone that is in the government has another problem, they're human. And so by being in the government, they're influenced by negative things. I'm telling you this because election day is coming soon. So here's my elections speech. Go vote. But just don't vote for anyone because they're a certain party or whatever the case may be. Use this as your guide. This is your voting guide. And so when you find people that are aligned with what the Word of God says, that's who you should be voting for. And when they are not aligned with what the Word of God says, um, you should consider who you're voting for. Now, is anyone going to... We're not electing a savior. We're electing a human that's flawed. So, just take that into consideration when, uh, you know, there, there's four pages to the ballot this year. There's a lot of people that are being put in positions and stuff. And so if you don't know, don't, you know, but I encourage everyone to find out, to know who they're marking the spot for. That was my election speech. How was it? Good. So remember that when you go vote. So in verse 9, we read, I will... Uh, I watched till thrones were put in place and the ancient of days was seated and his garment was white as snow and the hair of his head was like pure wool and his throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. This is very similar to the vision that John had of heaven, of God sitting on the throne and everything that was taking place in heaven. How can John and Daniel have similar visions when they lived many years apart, hundreds of years apart, but they had similar visions? Because it's the same God. And it's the same future. And it's the same events that are going to be taking place. If it were different, if each prophet came up with different prophecies about the future and stuff, I'd question whether or not the Bible was accurate. I say, well, what? The one guy says, you know, he had white hair. The other guy says that he had a rainbow streak through his hair. What, what's up with that, you know? So we know that prophecy is accurate only if it's fulfilled the way the prophecy was written. And so prophets that make mistakes are not prophets. And their prophecies are thrown out the window. 
But Daniel, how do I know Daniel was a prophet? How do I know Daniel was accurate? Because Jesus said in Matthew 24, 15, when you see the abomination of desolation as spoken of by Daniel the prophet, okay, well, that tells me that Daniel was a prophet. Jesus said it. So if Jesus said it, it wasn't like, oh, sure, Jesus, he didn't really know Daniel, you know, if he would have known Daniel. No, he, he knew Daniel. As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm almost questioning whether or not he wasn't part of the group that went there and visited with Daniel. There, there are Christophanies, an appearance of Christ before um, Jesus, and so maybe that was one but because we're all going to be there seeing the same thing the prophecies are going to be fulfilled accurately and we are going to be there that part of the ten thousands and thousands and we're, we're going to be part of that I don't know what number we are number 10,245 come forward I don't know what number we're going to be, but we're going to be there. We're going to see all of this happening right before our very eyes. And as Daniel describes this, as John describes this, I don't think the descriptions are very good. I think the descriptions help us try to put something in our mind, but it's kind of like if, if I were to describe to you a Lamborghini Countach, uh, it would come out sounding like a Ford Pinto. It, it would be like, okay, it has wheels and a steering wheel and, uh, you know, because I can't describe something that I can't fathom. John and Daniel, they're seeing something that's so amazing. Uh, you know, uh, there he is seated on the throne and it's just an awesome sight, but he, they you know, fiery wheels on the throne. That's strange. Have you seen a throne with wheels on it? Wheelchairs. No, God's not sitting in a wheelchair. Okay, but the wheels indicate that he travels. He's everywhere. He moves and he can see everything, go anywhere he wants to be. Uh, and that's really what the wheels indicate uh, in Bible prophecy. Verse 11. I watched then because of the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking. I watched till the beast was slain and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As for the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. And so the Antichrist will speak pompous words. Now, stop thinking politics and political people speaking pompous words. People speak pompous words and, you know, people, oh, you know what? Trump is the Antichrist because he speaks pompous words. No, he's just from Queens. And, and I know that because I'm from Queens. So not that I speak pompous words, but I grew up there. I, I, I know how New Yorkers grow up. So his body is going to be destroyed, meaning his soul will be separated from his body, but the soul will live on. The body is what is destroyed and it will be in the burning flame. Other leaders the ten horns, uh, they're going to lose their kingdom, uh, but they're going to remain alive. Verse 13, I was watching in the night uh, visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. And he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people's nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. Jesus 
is going to be taking over all the kingdoms forever. His term, the, the term used here, the son of man, is used in the four gospels 80 times. So we know who Daniel is talking about here. Even though the gospels hadn't been written yet, we know exactly who is talking about here. His dominion isn't just for a thousand years, the millennium. Most people picture that, okay, well, he's going to uh, set up his throne in Jerusalem for a thousand years. Uh, yes, that is going to happen, but his dominion goes on forever and ever and ever. It's never going to end. And I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit within my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. And I came near to one of those who stood by and asked him the truth of this. And so he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. Those great beasts, which are four, are four kings which will arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Daniel told us in verse 1 that he was going to give us just the main facts. That was all he was telling us were the main facts. So Daniel saw things that he wasn't giving us details about. He was giving us an overview of the main facts. It, it's kind of like when a parade goes down, the Macy's Day Parade in New York goes down the street. The Goodyear blimp is up at the top. The Goodyear blimp can see the front, can see the back of the parade, can see the whole parade as it winds through the streets. The thing is, from the Goodyear blimp, you can't make out faces. You can't hear the bands playing because the noise of the blimp is too distracting. You can't hear. It's all loud up there. Even though you can see everything going on, you can't see details. Well, God isn't like that. God can see the details, and he can see the whole thing from the beginning and the end too. But we can't see details about everything that's going to take place in the future, but we got the blimp view of everything. That's what the Word of God gives us. The 10,000 foot view of what is going to take place in our world. So a lot of times we try to nail it down to let's, let's get a little more detail. Let's land the blimp so I can see what's going on. Nope. We're going to be in the blimp until the time when we're out of here. And then when we're out of here, uh, we're going to be known just as we are known. We're, we are going to know just as we are known. What does that mean? I don't know. See, but it's scripture. So it tells me that, our, uh, that the answers that we're looking for, we're going to know. We're going to understand the things that we don't understand right now. So there's a lot of detail that we're not going to be given until we're face to face with the Lord. You ever wonder where your spirit resides? Well, Daniel tells us here in verse 15, Daniel was grieved in my spirit within my body. The spirit is within his body. That was before they had doctors that opened up your body to find these things. Well, you know what? the doctors open up bodies, they still can't find the Spirit. Because that's part of the Trinity. That's part of God creating us in His image. And the Spirit is within. The soul is within. And then we have the flesh. And um, trying to get rid of the flesh and live in the Spirit walk in the Spirit. In verse 18, we're told that we, the saints of the Most High, receive and possess the kingdom forever and ever. We. We're the saints of the Most High. 
The saints aren't people that die and then a church gets to tell them that they're saints. Saints are believers. Paul writes to the saints. The saints at so-and-so. And he writes to saints. Well, he's not writing to dead people. He's writing to people that are alive. We are saints. And we are the ones, the saints of the Most High, that are going to receive and possess the kingdom forever. Verse 19, Then I wished to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the others. Exceedingly dreadful, with its teeth of iron and its nails of bronze, which devoured broken pieces and trampled the residue with its feet. And the ten horns that were on its head, and the other horn which came up before which three fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth which spoke pompous words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. I was watching, and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them, until the Ancient of Days came, and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High, and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. That time is coming. You know, we think about the tribulation. It's a seven-year period that's going to take place, I believe, after the rapture. It's the rapture, tribulation, and then the second coming of Christ, and then the millennium. That's the sequence of events that I believe. Well, seven years isn't that long. I often think, seven years, where was I seven years ago? Well, it wasn't that long ago. In seven years ago. Well, seven years into the future, see, once we leave here, we're going to be in the presence of God. Uh, there's, I don't think there are going to be clocks up there. We're just going to have to wait for an angel to tell us when it's time to come back. But Okay, well, Jesus is collecting everyone. We're going to go get on your horse now. We'll have seven years to practice horseback riding. <laughs> And then we're going to come back with Jesus. And so, you know, that's a timeline that we really can't uh, narrow down. We can't, we can't understand the scope. I don't know what it's going to be like in heaven. All I know is that when we're there, we're not going to regret. We're not going to look back at the earth and say, wow, uh, you know, I, I wish I could have spent another week you know, I had tickets for this trip I was planning. You know, I was going to go on a cruise. I, we're not going to do that. We're not going to miss it. And then when we come back, we're going to be ruling and reigning with Christ. What an awesome thing. Daniel wanted more info on the fourth beast, the Roman Empire, and the Antichrist who's going to rise up. And he sees the beast making war against the saints and winning. That doesn't make much sense. What do you mean winning against the saints? Well, in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, we're told, and I say also that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Peter was not the first pope, sorry. Um, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And so what he's talking about is the church being formed and the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And so that almost contradicts you know, what's going on here where he sees the beast warring against the saints and winning. Well, these aren't, that isn't the church. That's tribulation saints. It's those that are living and went into the tribulation and then got saved because they had one of these. I'm, you know, I'm not marketing this for profit or anything like that. But they had something like that and they learned and got saved during the tribulation period. And because they don't take the mark, they're going to suffer. They're going to be martyred 
because they won't do what the Antichrist wants them to do. The two visions, uh, there's another um, section that I'm not going to read right now for time's sake. In Revelation chapter 13, there is another section all that talks all about the dragon who was given authority and given a mouth to speak great blasphemies and great things. And it was just like the pompous person that rose up. It's the Antichrist. But it says, it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. And so that is during the tribulation period. And all who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. All of the world that doesn't get saved is going to worship the Antichrist. And he is going to win this battle over the saints. He's going to be martyring the saints. He's allowed to exercise evil over the earth. Verse, uh, back in Daniel chapter 7, verse 23. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which shall be different from all the other kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth, trample it, and break it in pieces. The ten horns of ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom. And another shall arise after them, and he shall be different from the first ones, and shall subdue three kings. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change, change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. But the court shall be seated, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it forever. And then the kingdom of, and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under all of heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is everlast, an everlasting kingdom, and all domains shall serve and obey him. This is the end of the account. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly troubled me and my countenance changed, but I kept the matter in my heart. The saints will be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. That's three and a half years. That's the second half of the tribulation period. Often I speak about the, the abomination of desolation, that's when the Antichrist shows that he truly isn't a friend of the Jews and he goes to destroy them. And one third of them are um, skirted away to be protected by God, but two thirds of them are going to die because of the Antichrist. Daniel sees the end of the tribulation period and he sees who the victor is. It's Jesus. He sees that it's all going to be good. But that didn't give him a lot of peace. Daniel's dreams and visions told him how things would end, yet it still troubled him. And he kept it in his heart, meaning that he wasn't out there telling everyone, oh, you got to get prepared because Jesus is coming and, and all of this is going to happen and it's going to be horrible. That is not the message of the gospel. The message of the gospel is Jesus loves us and died for us so that we could spend eternity with him. That's the message of the gospel. And quite often we have people that want to go out there and tell about the bad news. Oh, if you don't, if you don't get saved, you're going to experience all this bad stuff that's going to happen. Well, you mean you want to scare them into a relationship with Jesus? That's not a good reason to have a relationship. My, my kids might have 
been scared by me sometimes coming home, you know, when they did something wrong. Uh, you know, but I didn't come home and beat them. I, I loved them. So I came home and I said, well, you're going to have to be disciplined, but, you know, uh, I love you and we're going to go on from this. Well, that's how Jesus wants to love the world. God wants us to recognize his love. His love was so expensive, it cost his son his life. And so that's the most important thing is that we recognize who Jesus is and what he has done for us. The answer for Daniel is having faith in God and having faith in the coming Messiah. God didn't give us the details. He gave us just enough to plan for the future. And we should be planning for the future. We're supposed to be occupying until he comes. Not like the Thessalonians running up the credit cards and, you know, waiting for, you know, Jesus to come. So we're just going to leave all this debt behind. And that's not what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be occupying, meaning we're supposed to be sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with everyone so that they can go with us. We want to include them in our tribe. We want them to be part of the family when that time comes. Daniel kept doing the work that God called him to do on earth and we should do the same. But because we know the end of the story, we should be doing everything to expand the kingdom of God by leading people into it, knowing who Jesus is, and the love that he has for them. Amen?